Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity this afternoon to proudly support this resolution, motion rather, which seeks to grant waivers on, of the value added tax on water tanks, fittings, pressure reducing valves, and other items necessary for water production, water harvesting, etc. Mr. Speaker, I speak from a public utilities standpoint. And the fact that I'm the minister responsible for public utilities under which water falls, as we speak, there are challenges within the water sector. Challenges in as far as our ability with the current infrastructure of water to be able not just to harness and to reserve, but our ability to maintain our own capacity of water in the country at a national level. During the period 2016 to 2021, the then government undertook as a project which was left behind by the previous government of the Labour Party to undertake the program or the initiative of dredging the John Compton Dam. Some $60 million, Mr. Speaker, was allocated and was, of course, accessed by the water company to commence the program of dredging the John Compton Dam. $60 million, million dollars, Mr. Speaker. The capacity of the John Compton Dam when it was built was to a capacity of just over 600 million gallons of water. Water that would have been able to facilitate and to provide to the people of this country for a long time, particularly in the north of the island. At that time when the John Compton Dam was built, then called the Roseau Dam, the intention was to have this northern facility provide water for the north of the island and then in the south to explore the potential of harnessing water out of the Grace Woodlands area for the south of the country, along with other initiatives that were in the making. In the initiative to dredge the Rosa Dam, Mr. Speaker, after three to four years of that project, only 8% of the dam was, was dredged. Only 8%, having spent $60 million, Mr. Speaker, engaged in an activity that was designed to move away from the original intention, move away from the scientific um, intention, and to do based on the whims and fancies of others in an endeavor and a claim of dredging, only 8%. It means, Mr. Speaker, that the people of this country are left now to fend for themselves fend for themselves to be able to put reserve at home in their community so as in any event as we see now the shortages which are happening the many cutoffs that we're having where you have Wasco having the need to shut down the system to allow them to be able to do repairs and therefore people now have got to think of how do I facilitate the collection of water and reserving of water and harnessing of water so as to be able to survive at any given time when Wasco shuts off the system. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, in an endeavor to improve the water system in this country, Wasco will need well over $250 million to undertake that exercise. The first part of it, Mr. Speaker, is to deal with the raw water line, which really and truly at this time should be the time to deal with it, because by now we would have finished the Roseau Dam, the, the, the John Compton Dam, and as far as the dredging is concerned, we would have improved our capacity, at least if we had improved the capacity from what it is now, from 200 million gallons 
to probably about four or five hundred million gallons, gallons, then we can move to the, the raw water line. The cost, Mr. Speaker, of, and, the, and I speak of the investment in the raw water line, from Vana to Cul-de-Sac is estimated at 27 million US dollars. That's the kind of investment we are called upon to do as a consequence of neglect. Then we've got the Fables treatment plant in Cicero, which is 50% operational. And that is another sum that we are now estimating in terms of refurbishing that plant and to bring it to maximum capacity. But even after we have brought it to maximum capacity, and even if the raw water line is improved to its full capacity, then we've got to deal with the water pipeline infrastructure throughout the country because there is a need to replace them. For many of you who move around in the north of the island, particularly in the city of Castries, many occasions our investment in road infrastructure is interfered by the fact that the deteriorating infrastructure of pipelines are busting every day, particularly when we build roads. Because once you build the roads and those pipelines are beneath the ground without having been replaced, then the vibration and compaction of equipment certainly deals with the mutilated and the decaying infrastructure beneath there. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, we are currently on the Chaussee Road with one of the initiatives for Infrastructure 24, and that is to, replay, to pave and reconstruct the Chaussee Road as one of the streets within the city of Castries, first one to be done. The decision was taken. Because those lines are busting so often, we must put in new pipelines. And so what is happening now, Mr. Speaker, is that we've given Wasco the opportunity to proceed and to put in those, in, uh, those pipelines, and presently today, in fact, some parts of the Chaussee Road has been closed to facilitate the construction on, and the excavation, excavation that is to take place to put in those pipelines. But the pipeline alone, Mr. Speaker, it took us six months to get the pipeline. The cost, $2.6 million. Beg your pardon? To, to, to establish the new pipelines. Six the entire project is over $6 million, say $7 million, to do that road, which includes the cost of the pipeline. But I've said all of this, Mr. Speaker, to give you an understanding of the inheritance of this administration, the inheritance of neglect, the inheritance of irresponsibility. So just imagine, Mr. Speaker, a gentleman decides that he will order vaccines valued at $7 million, no guarantees provided, nothing at all, no due diligence provided. That $7 million could have done Chaussee Road. That $7 million, Mr. Speaker, could have done Chaussee Road. And we are still without the vaccines, and I'm not too sure if we have recovered the $7 million. But that is the kind of neglect that we have inherited, the neglect of our infrastructure, the neglect of our schools, of our health services. You heard the Minister for Health, Mr. Speaker, earlier. I mean, this is a crying shame of any government who claims to be respons responsible. And so, Mr. Speaker, in many ways, small and big ways, this administration has demonstrated compassion. This administration has demonstrated understanding of the needs of the people. This, this administration, Mr. Speaker, has shown that it cares about the people. And what are we doing today? One may say, what is the big deal about waving VAT on water tanks? What is the big deal? My only concern about the deal is that the, the, um, the businesses, the businesses who are selling ensure that that is removed and that the customer benefits the initiative being provided here. So here we're saying fittings to make plumbing cheaper. Plastic tanks to give customers an opportunity to get plastic tanks, water tanks, at a reduced rate. 
water pumps, which, is, which are a necessity for persons wanting to establish water tanks, and when there's no water, to be able to ensure that they can pump and get the right pressure. Pressure reducing valves to ensure that when the pressure comes from Wasco, that those valves can reduce the pressure at an acceptable um, level for consumption. Check valves to ensure that there are no returns of water running your meter and draining your system into the, main, into the main grid. Safety and relief valves and other appliances and parts for the water system. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is an initiative that must be undertaken and it's an initiative that must be embraced by all. Because it's, a, it's one thing if your electricity goes out and then you can have a, a torchlight or a candle or a lamp once you're ready. But it's one thing when water goes out and you have no water and you have to go searching for water. So the thing is to be able to get everyone to develop a new culture of having water reserve within their home environment. In my case, I remember, Mr. Speaker, once I experienced one drought season, no water, and I invested in water tanks to the extent that um, water tanks are all over, that I can never run out of water at any given time. That is the thing. But, Mr. Speaker, we are saying, we are saying, give every individual an opportunity. And the government has started. We heard what the Ministry of Agriculture is doing providing farmers with water tanks so that they, can, they are able to ensure that they, 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 they can get the farmers to water the, the plants and vegetables and to keep them healthy and productive at any given time. In other circles, in other departments, we have done that. In my constituency, we are about launching a, a similar program to assist persons. But Mr. Speaker, the most important thing, I always believe is not just to say give water tanks to harness water from the main grid, from the, 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 the Wasco lines, but also to be able to harness the rainwater. I believe that we now need to tell people, listen, when you build your homes, design a water system that will allow you to harness the water sufficiently to reduce the, number, the, the amount of runoff that may take place into your streams and ravines. So all of that water in a properly designed system connect, connected together into your underground water tank or into your tank below the surface of your home or the, or, or the pipeline so that at any given time you can get that water to use. And that's where the pumps come in because in many instances water will not be able to get up to the, your shower if, it has a, if, if the tanks are at the same level with your floor. In some countries, Mr. Speaker, and I know for sure Bermuda, Bermuda, the Development Control Authority will not approve any plan, any housing plan whatsoever, unless you have a water, a water harnessing system designed into the house. And it must be, it, it must be implemented. It is not one that you say, yes, I'm, here's my design, and you, you show it, but you don't do it, you must do it because the inspectors will come and if you do not implement it, your, your project is stopped. The time has come for us to do that sort of thing here, to ensure that every home that is designed, every building that is designed, demonstrates that there is a system that will harness that water off the roof into a system that can be, that can be used at any, any given time. The same thing, Mr. Speaker, and I've been speaking to the people at planning and DCA, that we also need to look at a requirement for construction of homes and other businesses to ensure that every building, every building is designed with an off-street parking facility, a garage or something. It doesn't matter where you're up a hill or down a hill at the bottom on the flat, but designed with something. The only caveat to that, Mr. Speaker, we understand that when people who do not have the financial means may not be able to build a house and then provide the necessary parking facility. Because if you're building on a hillside, a slope, based on the gradient, that might be a steep one, and then you've got to spend extra money in putting up columns and then building that carport. 
But you can say, listen, build your house. Later on, you'll put, up, you'll put your carport and give them ideas out as to how to do it and how to utilize the space above and below the, that carport that they're building. These are some of the things we must do. It has to be, Mr. Speaker, a level of sensitization of our people of some of the essential needs that we need for our daily living. What do we need? Food, clothing, and shelter, basic. But there are other services that we need to put in place. We are getting to a point, Mr. Speaker, where with renewable energy, many people understand the importance of having their own solar systems to be able, the photovoltaic systems, to be able to generate their own electricity. Soon we'll be coming to the Parliament, Mr. Speaker, and we'll be presenting a new Electricity Supplies Act, which will then open up the market for electricity production, energy production, so that while the main energy operator in St. Lucia, who enjoys a monopoly at this time, will continue to be able to generate electricity from fossil fuels, people, independent power producers, and others will be able to participate into the system to generate electricity for their own use, but also to be able to sell back into the grid and to be compensated for what they have sold to the grid, the excess. So these are some of the things that we as a government believe that we must at least enshrine in the people, in the psyche, at least to get them sensitized to the needs. And so, in this initiative, Mr. Speaker, here this afternoon, as a consequence of this resolution, the initiative to waive value-added tax on all of those related items to do with water harvesting and storage and, 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 and transmission and pumping and all of this sort of thing is indeed a bold initiative on the part of the government, and I stand here and support this initiative this afternoon. I thank you.